Welcome, everybody. It's nice to have you here tonight. Uh, it's a chilly night in North Carolina. I assume it's chilly up in Canada and other places. This should be an interesting conversation. Um, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin is a or was a French Jesuit priest, a theologian, and philosopher. And he once said, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. Rather, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. So he kind of flips that on its head. And I, I really like that. We It's one of the, uh, if you go to the uh, meetup uh, site, you'll see that quote there. Consciousness Cafe was created to help people explore the significance of this statement. Our meetings are a combination of in-person gatherings and Zoom presentations. We record the Zoom meetings and upload them to our YouTube channel called The Consciousness Cafe. We encourage you to visit our website, uh, www.consciousness-cafe.com, and view past presentations on our YouTube channel. Tonight, our meeting is focused on the convergence of science and, and metaphysics. We have three presenters tonight, myself, Daniel, and Mark, and we'll be providing information to help make the case for this convergence. After each presentation... I'm What's sorry, that? I'll be actually presenting tonight as well. Well, excellent. I wasn't sure you were going to do that. So Leslie will be the fourth, so the rest of us will have to... Um, Make sure we stay within our time guidelines so we get everybody in. Um, so we, um, we're looking forward to this after each individual presentation. If you want to ask questions of the presenter or make some statements, feel free to uh, uh, do that. So I'm going to start with a look at uh, near-death experiences. I think that there's some pretty good evidence that indicates um, Consciousness survives death. And I'd like to start with maybe a little exercise. If you would think for a minute, um, a scale of one to 10, where at the one end of the scale, uh, we believe that consciousness is created by the brain. And on the other end of the scale, 10, we say consciousness can exist independently of the brain. So take a moment and think about where you are on that uh, that spectrum. I suspect that most of you are probably at the midpoint or higher, but uh, you know, decide for yourself where you stand on that. And after I'm done presenting some cases, I want you to go back and rethink that uh, that rating and see if it's shifted at all. So let's start with um, maybe a fairly simple case. There's an excellent book. Um, second edition of which has just recently come out. It's called The Self Does Not Die. I don't know if that's coming across backwards to you or not. Uh, when I look at it, it the, the letters are backwards. So, Daniel, it's okay. So, The Self Does Not Die. It's an interesting collection of anecdotes submitted mostly by medical personnel who have had a patient who had a near-death experience and an aspect of that experience indicates that this wasn't just a hallucination or the creation of an addled mind. So the first case I'll reference is uh, one where a patient uh, had a cardiac arrest and was being operated on by a team of physicians. And during that operation, this person's consciousness, uh, they, they went into a, a fairly routine near-death experience their consciousness left their body, and they could observe what was going on around them, could hear the conversations. Um, and in this particular case, uh, there was a surgeon who had a peculiar habit of flapping his arms like he was a bird flying. And this person in this near-death state saw that surgeon uh, flapping his arms. So after he's been resuscitated, He's talking to the next day to uh, his cardiac surgeon, and he tells him about this experience and tells him about the motions of this one surgeon on the team flapping his arms. 
Well, this was pretty surprising to the surgeon because, in fact, that physician did that pretty routinely. It was his way of, of helping to dry his hands through the air by flapping his arms. And it was unique to that individual. So to see this doctor doing that uh, was quite astonishing to the cardiac surgeon. And he was the one who submitted this uh, particular anecdote to the book, The Self Does Not Die. There's another case in the book, um, another cardiac case. An individual um, had a cardiac arrest. Their consciousness, as they report it, left their body. And as they hovered over at the ceiling toward the high end of the room, they noticed that there was a quarter sitting on the top of a piece of, uh, on top of a cardiac monitor. And this quarter was the monitor is about eight feet high. So this quarter is outside the view of anybody who's on the floor. There isn't anybody eight feet tall. But that person clearly saw a 1985 quarter on top of this monitor. The next day, the surgeon came in, was checking on his patient, and uh, the patient was so um, certain that the, he had seen something remarkable that he convinced the surgeon to check it out to see is there in fact a quarter up on top of that monitor. So the surgeon was able to locate a step ladder. He climbed up and to his amazement, there in fact was a 1985 quarter sitting on top of this cardiac monitor. There's another book that I'll point to. It's called mm. Mind Sight. It was put out by uh, two researchers. One is pretty well known. Ken Ring uh, was one of the founders of IANS. He was a professor at uh, University of Connecticut and taught many classes on near-death experiences. The second person was Sharon Cooper. They were able to identify, I think it was probably 30 individuals, blind individuals, who had had either a near-death experience or an out-of-body experience. And what they were looking for was, um, what was that experience like? What did you see? What did you notice? Were there things that would uh, indicate you saw things that you couldn't see with your normal eyesight? And in fact, that's what they found. Uh, they found a number of people could accurately describe what was going on around them, what people were wearing, maybe the length of hair of somebody who was working on them. Um, they could accurately describe the scene when their body was in a near-death state. This is kind of a fascinating concept, but somebody once uh, suggested that perhaps this was just uh, a dream or a hallucination. It's, there's been some research done on blind people, and people who've been blind from birth uh, do not, they, although they dream, they do not have visual dreams. Their dreams uh, tend to correspond with their other senses. So the idea that uh, somebody would have, a blind person from birth would have a, a near-death experience where they can accurately report what's going on around them, um, it can't be described as being a dreamlike state. And there's one other um, that I'd like to share with you. There's a little more detail. This is an interesting one. A woman named Pam Reynolds had a brain aneurysm. And this brain aneurysm was very large. And where it was located in her brain, uh, she would not be a likely candidate for traditional aneurysm surgery. Because if they happened to rupture this bulge in, in a vein in her, in her brain, it would cause her brain to be flooded with blood and probably kill her on the operating table. So she went to a specialized clinic out in the Southwest. And at this clinic, they had a unique uh, approach to operating on these. Did you retire yet? Yeah, the end of December. All somebody, right. Somebody needs to uh, to mute themselves. Happy to hear that you retired. But uh, anyway, back to the case. Uh, so Pam Reynolds went to the specialized clinic out in the Southwest. Um, where their technique is very interesting. Um, they lower the patient's body temperature gradually down to about 60 degrees, which effectively shuts down the brain. 
And at that, uh, at the point that it reaches 60 degrees, um, and the brain appears to be not functioning anymore, they tilt the table so that Pam's head was elevated, and they drain the blood out of her body, out of her head. So in effect, her brain is, is uh, not functioning. Now, there's some other aspects to the surgery that uh, are important to know. Um, Pam's eyes were taped shut, and the doctors sealed noise generators in her ear canals, uh, sealed in with wax, so that uh, the brain will react to these high decibel noises. Um, and as the body temperature comes down, the brain reacts less and less to these noises in the ear, and eventually the brain stops uh, functioning, stops showing any reaction uh, to this, uh, to the noise. So once Pam's temperature got down, her brain was basically shut down. They tilt the table, drain the blood uh, out of her body. Um, it turns out they had a little bit of a problem. Um, where they drain the blood out is um, in a femoral artery, in other words, an artery in the upper leg. And when they first tried to connect into the uh, uh, femoral artery on the right leg, they had a problem, so they had to shift to the left leg. So Pam is in this uh, state, and uh, as they're going through this operation, at some point, she comes out of her body. And she can uh, perceive what people are saying. She can observe what people are doing. Uh, she could accurately describe later on the tools that they were using to open up her skull. Um, pretty remarkable that uh, that she would be able to report on these things when her her body is 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 in a death state. Uh, her brain is not functioning, and for her to be able to accurately report what was going on around her at that time uh, is was a pretty remarkable story. And you will find that story also in the book, The Self Does Not Die. You could probably also find uh, some YouTube videos, because I know Pam has been interviewed on the subject. So if you, if you found that interesting, you could um, look them up on YouTube or find uh, references to them on the internet. So now I've given you these uh, examples. Uh, let's go back to the uh, rating. Uh, think about whether these examples that provide some evidence that uh, uh, things can be perceived um, are not dependent upon a functioning brain. And does that shift your uh, rating any at all? I would guess that in a, in a uh, random segment of our population, uh, there's maybe less appreciation for subjects like this. So it may be that there's not a lot of shifting on your part, but if anybody would like to share their thoughts, um, I'm done with a formal presentation and invite uh, questions or comments. Yeah, yeah prob you probably have to unmute yourself if you're trying to talk. Yeah, uh, Jim, I'd like to just add a comment to what you had said about the uh, blind near-death experiences. Uh, there was a documentary that Caroline Corey did in 2020 called Superhuman, and one of the segments in that documentary was the training of children to use their third eye. And mm -hmm. they put on blindfolds and would be instructed to, you know, tell us what this color is, tell us what this number is. And they eventually got to the point to where they could be blindfolded and go into a grocery store and pick up a can of beans or or a can of something off of a shelf and, and go right to it using their third eye only. So that kind of adds another corroborating evidence to what a, a blind person who has an NDE might experience. Yes, I remember seeing, uh, I can't remember where I saw it, but it was an, something similar to that. There were three sisters that put on blindfolds and tossed a beach ball between them. So they couldn't tell when the ball was being thrown to them, but somehow they were able to perceive that the ball was on its way and catch it and toss it to the next one. So. The idea, I guess, is that we have perceptual abilities that uh, maybe are, are in our normal waking hours are very overshadowed by our five senses. 
but there are capacities for perceiving things um, beyond those traditional senses. Well, it must be somebody that has something they'd like. To... Jim? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? I'm Arun. I'm new to this, and uh, okay, it's a uh, it's a very interesting uh, discussion that we are having. Uh, uh, I my two cents to add. So uh, th there was an experiment done in terms of uh, consciousness and mind, and basically what they say is, is uh, the experiment basically said if someone were to ask you a question, let's say two plus two. The neurons that uh, fire to get you the answer fire few milliseconds before the neurons that will the motor neurons so that you write things or uh, the neurons which get fired when you hear things. So basically what it's explaining is there is another part in your mind. We call it consciousness or uh, probably uh, another layer which would answer and then you listen to it and then you act on it. So these are two distinct things. So in the experiments that, in the examples that you gave, uh, the first one and the third one, I could somehow relate to that. For example, when someone could realize that the doctor was flapping uh, like a chicken, mm -hmm. um, rest of his senses were still active. So he was able to make sense. It's just that he could not respond or act on it. But the second example that you gave where someone could recognize a coin on top of a shelf, that's a little, uh, uh, I, I don't see a way to explain that. Uh, having said that, uh, I still lean towards the side where uh, at this point with the knowledge we have, we are not able to explain something like that. But uh, I'm certain as we move along, there could be something which would connect us to that subconscious in a very, very practical sense that we are able to explain that. Maybe then we'll get an answer to this near death experience as so as to speak. Yeah, I think it's important. Um, we may never be able to prove things definitively, but as scientists, um, we look to the data. You know, what, what does the data show us? And um, is our hypothesis about consciousness um, well suited to explain something? And if it isn't, um, I tend to be of the mind of saying, I want to think about it, and I don't want to say, well, someday we'll come up with an explanation. Um, here's another example from the, uh, the self does not die. A woman, I think it was a woman, was in... Um, a cardiac arrest unit when she actually had a cardiac arrest. Her consciousness left her body and she went up through the ceiling into the room above the cardiac uh, uh, care unit. And she saw tables around this room with what appeared to be bodies lying on each table. But there wasn't anybody uh, tending to these. There is no activity in that room. So it seemed kind of strange to see all these bodies lying on beds, but nobody was there. So after she's resuscitated, she tells her surgeon about this experience. And the surgeon is, is pretty uh, amazed by this because he knows the room over the cardiac arrest, the cardiac care unit, is where they do their CPR training. So in fact, her description of what she saw in the room above her was uh, pretty accurate. They have uh, bodies that get worked on in the CPR training lying on these beds, but uh, there isn't anybody there when they're not doing any training. So there are other examples of, of this. Um, there was another one, a gentleman and his wife were on a vacation, probably uh, 1500 miles from home. And he has, uh, um, uh, emergency. I don't know if it was a cardiac arrest, but something that uh, brought him near death, and he has a near-death experience. In his experience, um, his consciousness uh, didn't just go to a, a nearby place. It went back to his home, 1,500 miles away. And he observed as his body, as his consciousness went into his home, 
that on the dining room table where a mail was being accumulated, there was a uh, catalog uh, from a foreign country lying on there, uh, you know, some kind of gift catalog or something. Uh, so he made note of that, but he also observed that uh, his the person who was tending to his home in his absence was making love to a woman in a bedroom. So he's resuscitated. He shares this with his uh, his wife and his surgeon that this is what he saw. When he goes home, in fact, there on the dining room table is this catalog he had seen. And when he confronted the person who was caring for his home about what he'd, he'd seen about the sex, uh, the man admitted to it and owed up to that, that yes, he had indeed done that. So I kind of look at these, you know, there's enough of these experiences that uh, make you think something, that some perceptual ability is going on that is not related to the five senses. Here's another study that was done. This is kind of interesting. Um, the researchers had a computer that had a bank of uh, pictures in it. Half the pictures had emotional content, such as a child in distress or a, a scene of a fire or uh, maybe the after effects of a, an earthquake um, or anything that would get your attention pretty quickly. The other half were just uh, relatively innocuous pictures, might be a, a picture of a lake. Um, so what they did was they hooked up the subjects to a galvanic skin response measurement. And they measured the uh, participants' galvanic skin, so basically the uh, degree of uh, resistance to the flow of electricity in the skin. Um, they used them in lie detector tests, but basically the uh, they wanted to measure um, the galvanic skin response to randomly displayed pictures. So the computer, the, the participant would press a button, and six seconds later, um, the computer would randomly pick one of these pictures out, and they would measure the galvanic skin response from the moment that button is pressed to start the process to a few seconds after the picture has been, has been shown. And it's no surprise that uh, if the picture that comes up has emotional content in it, there's an elevated galvanic skin response. What was interesting was what happens in that six second interval before the picture comes up. If the picture that's going to be coming up is has emotional content, the galvanic skin response is higher than if the picture that's going to be coming up is um, an innocuous one. So again, that might point to the potential for us having a perception, uh, maybe a perception of the future um, that uh, is only gets exhibited, not consciously, but through our, our body reaction to uh, what's going to be happening. Sheila. Hey, yeah, I was just thinking, um... Oftentimes, uh, a help to some people in understanding how consciousness can be uh, in one place or many places at the same time is when when folks begin to realize that they can expand their own consciousness and that they can actually travel to another dimension and receive information, particularly of a healing nature and mm -hmm. my um uh experience and once the experience is sort of rooted in their consciousness you know it becomes not so much a question but a fact that consciousness is everywhere and you can touch it if you just go there mm -hmm. and so experience in my mind is a great teacher yes and the techniques and everything that you learn when you expand your consciousness, I think are important in that realization process that, uh, you know, consciousness is everywhere. I think if you ask any near-death experiencer whether there was legitimacy to their out-of-body portion of their experience, 
they would say definitely. Yeah. So we've taken a fair amount of time on this subject. Let's uh, move along um, to the next one. Uh, not sure if there's a priority. Daniel, Leslie, Mark, one of you want to take the next round? Yeah, let me uh, let me say a few words. Uh, first of all, we sort of jumped into this without uh, uh, giving an overview of what we're what we're doing here. Um, we've got four different speakers on four different subjects, presenting different aspects of the perspective of uh, a scientific perspective on sp the soul, spirituality, things of that nature, um, and. We have a two hour meeting, so it's going to be approximately uh, 30 minutes per speaker. And we will take questions if you want to put a question in the chat or if you want to raise your hand, use the raise hand function under the reactions uh, section. We will recognize you as we just did with that last subject. Um, Mark or Leslie, are either of you interested in going next? If I'll be glad to do it if Mark doesn't. Uh, Mark, are you? Do, do you want to go next? So, Oops. I, by I, way, was, I was thinking of going last, if that's okay. Okay. Oh, okay. So, by way of introduction, uh, Leslie will be speaking about shamanism. Mark will be speaking about is reality wave based. And I will be speaking about uh, ET UFOs and recent disclosures that have been made. So, Leslie, did you want to go? I'll be glad to. All right. So, um, good evening, everyone. I'm going to be talking a, a bit about in shamanism and how it intersects with science. So, what is shamanism? Shamanism is a um, spiritual practice that's been practiced for tens of thousands of years. There are some suggestion in the cave paintings of Lascaux and um, Chauvet that um, some of the images suggest a shamanic experience. For example, uh, there is a, a, a woman's legs with a bison head. And uh, there are other elements of the caves as well that suggest this. When we look at extant um, indigenous populations, we see threads of commonality that are not only existence in to, existing today, but also seem to go back. And in fact, uh, the word shaman was coined in the 17th century through ethnographers that were looking at uh, the Mongolian peoples. And uh, they referred to their, their shamans as shamans. And um, that word became popular to describe practices that um, involve going into altered states, connecting with spirit for the purposes of gaining information, for healing, for oneself and for the community. And um, these practices vary widely from culture to culture and across time, but there are some very core elements that are uh, consistent. And that is that all, regardless of what one calls oneself, if one is engaged in the work of communing with spirit and uh, uh, maintains a worldview that everything has spirit. So the rocks, the trees, the animals, us, the weather, everything has spirit, uh, then that individual is considered to be um, using shamanic practices. Uh, shaman, but to be a shaman, is really not a designation. It has become a popularized thing in the West to call oneself shaman. But in fact, in indigenous cultures, who gets to be a shaman is actually uh, designated by the community. And it's the people that have uh, been able to demonstrate that they can use their power of connecting to the spirit world for the help of the community. And so, um, in, um, in, in modern parlance, we use shamans, and sh the word sh shaman to express a very wide umbrella of uh, approaches and, pra and practices. So another core element of shamanism is journey work. And I would say from my perspective that journey work is probably the core element. And journey work involves getting into uh, an altered state. And this can happen through 
uh, a myriad of ways through sonic driving, which could be drumming and rattling, chanting, uh, ecstatic dance would be another way, uh, ecstatic postures. And that um, comes out of the work of Felicitas Goodman, where she uh, discovered that these really kind of odd postures that she was seeing in caves and on um, uh, particular pieces of pottery and what have you, uh, when in, held in a particular way, helped somebody reach an altered state. And that work, uh, interestingly enough, is um, there's a psychologist by a psychiatrist by the name of Nicholas Brink, who was using some of these ecstatic postures in, in, in therapy and helping people in um, today with common problems, with uh, um, problem, modern problems, using these very ancient techniques and helping people in a therapeutic setting without necessarily the use of drugs. So that's, I think, quite interesting. And he actually has some of his patients drumming or he's doing the drumming and they're going into literally an altered state. So um, as we think about this the um, and tie it into some of what's being talked about tonight, an altered state is um, really kind of an out of, out of body experience. And in this out of body experience, the practitioner enters into the spirit realm. And in the shamanic cosmology, there's um, three, and again, this can vary across time and cultures, but in the Western point, from the Western point of view, there are at least, there are three realms, and that would be the upper, the middle, and the lower. The middle is what we experience in our day-to-day, -day, and then there's a spiritual, um, uh, component that is that mirrors the ordinary ordinary reality. Then there's the upper world and the lower world, and this is really should not be um, confused with the concepts of an heaven and hell because it's not the same. These are just different spaces, and uh, the uh, experiences of the upper world are qualitatively different, but. Uh, as far as being uh, more elevated or being able to learn more, experiencing something that's better in the upper is not going to be any different than the lower. They're different experiences, but they're not different by hierarchical, as in uh, up is good and down is bad. Um, there's been some very interesting work around in the neuroscience uh, field around uh, not necessarily sh uh, shamanic practition um, practices necessarily, but around this notion of um, out of body experiences and um, uh, using breathing techniques, for example, to to enter into meditative states. There's a really interesting study that looked at hypnosis, and what they found is that people that are highly suggestible have a heightened sense of uh, discernment. And that is happening in the ACC, which is the, and I'll have to look at my notes for that one, uh, the um, anterior cingulate cortex. And this was measured by an fMRI. And what I think is very interesting about this is that these shamanic practices that have been handed down from generation to generation in indigenous cultures and in the West here, there's been a real effort to, to uh, reconnect, re-remember these practices, which um, even in the European tradition would have been, um, were alive and well up until probably four or five, 600 years ago when Christianity took root and there was an awful lot of purging of these um, uh, considered quote unquote primitive primitive techniques. So uh, we can go back to, for example, there's hints of it if we think about um, the Irish mythology, Norse mythology, uh, give us clues to what kind, uh, what that shamanic culture might have looked like. And so, for example, in the Norse mythology, uh, which was very fascinating to me, that Freya was considered the first shaman. And um, some of that mythology, of course, informs how we have been in the West trying to re-remember and reconnect to these practices. 
Um, Michael Goodman, uh, Michael Harner, uh, with his work with indigenous cultures in South America, and he was also involved with uh, the Tungus people in Mongolia, I think has been um, uh, a leader in this reconnection in the West. But from our perspective uh, in the West, some of these um, techniques are being uh, validated and supported by the work that's being, do, that's being done in the neuroscience field. Uh, another aspect that I think is really interesting is that DMT, uh, which is a substance uh, that is in ayahuasca, has a, um, our brains have receptor sites in the, uh, uh, the same receptor sites that uh, for the neurotransmitter serotonin. So when you think about uh, cannabinoids, mescaline, DMT, all of these substances have an analogous receptor sites in the brain. So if we think about um, evolution as being adaptive, so in other words, we, we, uh, we adapt and that's why we have certain things like it was adaptive to have uh, hands because it helped us, our, our ancestors survive. So when you think about it from that perspective, it's interesting in the sense that uh, we have these receptor sites in the brain that allow these hallucinogenic experiences. So we take ayahuasca, for example, or we take mescaline, and these uh, that the uh, psychoactive substance binds to receptor sites in the brain. So that means that our brains are physiologically capable of creating or absorbing these uh, substances that allow us to have uh, hallucinogenic or out of uh, altered state type of experiences. Uh, and with ayahuasca, uh, another element that is quite fascinating to me, uh, Jerry, Jeremy Nardby uh, did some work around um, with South American, I can't remember the tribe, it might've been Shipabo, but I'm not entirely uh, sure about that. And in his work with them, he was working with the, one of their, their curanderos, which is a, a shaman, what we might call a shaman in the West. And uh, he eventually had an ayahuasca experience and he wanted to understand how they knew to work with the plants because ayahuasca, uh, unless it is prepared a very particular way, there is an inhibitor, meaning that you take it, but you won't get uh, the hallucinogenic effect because your body uh, does, uh, does not process it. So they process it in such a way that they um, allow this hallucinogenic effect to, to be present. And uh, in asking how that was so, how could, because this had been uh, handed down for you know, hundreds of generations, how was this so? And uh, the, the curandero responded that the, talk, the plants talk to them. And that is not uncommon when you look into indigenous tribes that they have this knowledge. And when we ask how did they get that knowledge, they will tell you that the, the spirit of the plant or the spirit of the animal or the spirit of the rock uh, told them about this. Uh, there's another very fascinating field about weather shamanism. And there's a, an interesting book written by Nan Moss. And, uh, in that book, she reports that she and her husband did work and uh, the weather spirits came to them and gave them a particular dance to do. And they had done it. They uh, subsequently ended up doing this ceremonial dance several times and they were actually affecting the local weather. And there are um, and there's anecdotal evidence that uh, people who are doing this kind of work, working with the spirits in this way, can affect the material world by, through this work. So I think what's happening is that these shamanic techniques that are tens of thousands of years old are um, first off survived over time which means they must have had some benefits, some use to the people, or they would not have been carried on. I think that there has been a real effort in the uh, West to reconnect to this, um, this, this way of being in the world. And as I said, 
sh shamanic practice is not a religion. Sometimes it is tied to religions, but in and of itself, it is not. It, it accepts whatever religion um, perspective you may come from and acknowledges that there is spirit in everything and that, that, that we can, as human beings, connect to those spirits and gain knowledge from that spirit, of those spirits. So I think as time goes by, more and more of the research will support what um, our ancestors have known and our practitioners know today that there is a there is there is something that transcends our physical sense our our sensory perception and allows us to um, experience healing and divination and I and I wanted to point out one more one other thing which I think was very interesting um, there is a technique whereby a, a shaman or a person doing this kind of work will go into an altered state and and go and put things in in the material world in the middle world and others will then go into their altered states and work with their helping spirits and be able to identify where those things were placed in the middle world in the in the in the material world so that is harkens to remote viewing so there's a lot of different crossovers when we think about out-of-body experiences and remote viewing um, that lend itself to this notion that the, that we call this shamanism, or you may call it an out-of-body experience, you may call it something else, but it is all tapping into this thing that uh, some may call God or source or whatever that is... Um, that is present regardless of what um, religion we may practice or traditions that, that we may hold. And I think slowly neurosciences uh, in particular is, is supporting some of those views. So I'm gonna stop there and ask if there's any questions. I'll throw something out, Leslie. Um, sure. you, many of you know that um, I have traveled to Peru, the Amazon jungle, to experience ayahuasca. Um, and they tell you down there that plant consciousness can talk to you. Um, in one of my states of, um, after ingesting this ayahuasca, I found myself having a, an experience on a, a wooden platform high in the trees looking out over a beautiful uh, natural scene. And it was just a very uplifting, very pleasant experience. But then I remembered um, some the the people who ran the place that were doing this um, this this work said you can if you want to ask Mother Ayahuasca a question, you can do that. So I remembered that from this place up on this platform. This it was a hallucination, obviously, but. Um, I posed the question to Mother Ayahuasca, what does all this mean? And as soon as I placed that question, the scene had a little adjustment to it. Bunches of fruit showed up on the uh, uh, platform with me. It wasn't a verbal communication, um, but it seemed to me I was being told by some, you know, some idea was coming to me from an outside source telling me I didn't need to do anything. Everything was fine. Everything was being provided for me. Um, and I'll share another experience that a friend of mine had, a, a, a friend who is, uh, became a king in Togo. One of the things he had to do to become a king was go into a sacred forest and have a conversation with a tree. Now, from a Western point of reference, that sounds absurd. How could you have a conversation with a tree? But uh, my friend assured me that this was an auditory conversation that, that he had with the tree. And he said that if I had been there by his side, I would have heard it. I asked him if uh, this tree could speak any other language other than his, his native language. And he said, well, I imagine it could speak any language it wants. So the notion that um, there's a uh, distinction between humans and 
the rest of creation, um, you know, if plants are capable of conscious thought uh, and communicating, um, why can't other things, uh, other animals have means of communicating? I'd like to add, well, I'd like to add one other thing too, is I uh, watched a video one time of a fellow talking about his shaman experience and learning shamanism. And the final exam for him was the shaman in the village where he was at hid an object somewhere in the village and he had to find it. And uh, he ended up going beside this tent and digging a hole about a foot deep and uh, he didn't find it. And they told him to go, you know, do, do this again. So he went back and repeated it and he dug a hole about a foot next to, to where he had dug the first hole and found like a cup or an urn or whatever. And that was the object that had been hidden. So it had been hidden in the ground and he had to find it. And I thought that was, that was interesting too, just from the aspect of what you had to do in order to be able to get it. Well, in some cultures, and I'm thinking about the ship above, uh, they go through under uh, their initiations are very, very physically taxing. Um, very. In fact, I think one in one ritual they're they're dealing with um, ants, uh, stinging ants, as I recall. It can be very, very physically arduous. All right. Anything else to add or close it out? Anybody got a comment? Going once, going twice. All right, thank you, Leslie. Appreciate that very much. Okay, hello folks. That was Leslie Rice, and uh, originally was Jim Fisher. I'm Daniel Endy, along with Mark Hunter Brooks. We are Consciousness Cafe. So thank you for joining us. My subject for this evening, is going to be ETs, UFOs, and disclosure. Uh, there have been a lot of recent developments. There have been many questions for many years. What are what are, are we seeing in the sky? There have been tons of UFO reports. Some of you may know, um, certainly the, one of the most famous cases, the Roswell incident, where uh, they announced they had found a U U UFO, and then the next day they said it was a weather balloon. Um, and the people involved on the ground uh, were terrified. They were, they were uh, intimidated and told that uh, they should not touch the subject, don't say anything, and um, were variously threatened by uh, agents of the government at the time. And since then, this has grown into a, a lot of different potential avenues. Some people say it's, it's always been fake. Uh, a lot more have come to believe that there's a lot going on that we're not being told about. There's the, uh, an incident where there were UFOs over LA and there's some photos of them being spotlighted and, and this uh, sighting went on for some time. And uh, it was a, a national incident, but then we forgot about it, it went away. There was an incident of, of UFOs being sighted over the White House uh, in, in the Capitol. And uh, again, it was kind of put aside. Then there's the famous quote from, I believe it was Dwight Eisenhower who said, uh, we need to beware of the military industrial complex. And it's believed that those comments by Mr. Eisenhower were due to the fact that he realized there was a major um, problem developing in the government where 
they had created a, a secret section of the government to deal with the UFO situation because they thought, according to the, the theory here, that it would be a tremendous advantage in the Cold War. And so they created this secrecy program and kept it under wraps to the degree where it got more and more private. And even the, the president, uh, various presidents were not being informed of what was going on because it was on a need to know basis and things were compartmentalized. Well, you can know about this part, but you can't know about that part. And there were very few folks who, who knew the whole story. Um, so then this developed along and, and they had Project Blue Book where uh, J. Allen Hynek was originally poo-pooing all these sightings and explaining them away. But later he came out and said, uh, he felt that there was some validity to a lot of the sightings that he had dismissed. And so I, I give you all that as a historical precedent to the current situation. So currently the, the press um, for the last 50 years have, have really kind of looked askance at UFO stories. Uh, whenever real ones came up, uh, real potential, real situations came up, the uh, witnesses were visited by intimidating people and told to, to be quiet. Uh, whenever somebody found out something that they shouldn't know, they were uh, suppressed. And the, and the press was does, uh, the press was encouraged to to make fun of these sightings and these people, um, to, to discredit these people. But more recently, now, um, with the advent of cable TV and all of these uh, programs, the History Channel, um, it, it's been joked, sh should be renamed the UFO Channel because of all the ancient aliens and UFO sighting um, uh, documentaries that they've run. But more recently, even with the advent of YouTube and, and even more information coming out, it's becoming much more of a, an actual topic that you can talk about. Back in approximately 1999, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Stephen Greer did the Disclosure Project and had a whole slew of credible government and um, official witnesses at the press club in Washington, DC. And uh, there's a whole documentary on this and it created a, a stir, but of course it kind of went back underground and um, not much was said for a while. Uh, I'll put aside the various uh, speakers on these subjects and, and the ways in which they uh, undermine their own credibility from time to time. And I want to talk to you about, and I'm going to share some uh, some headlines here. So let's do this. Now, first one I'm going to share with you is recent that Congress ordered, this is from last year, orders UFO records released, but then they drop a bid for broader disclosure. A newly passed measure directs the National Archives to collect documents related to UFOs and disclose confidential records within 25 years, but stop short. So there's still a fair amount of influence. Then we have the Pentagon launching a one-stop shop for declassified information about UFOs, okay? Then we have a testimony this is from July. Some of you may have seen the um, news where Congress held hearings and various military veterans and others testified. One in particular was David Grush, or Grush who specifically mentioned that they had retrieved or recovered non-human biologics. That is to say, aliens. Uh, so things are starting to uh, crack around the seams on the on the whole UFO front. 
And some here's an article from USA Today. Did America get ripped off on the disclosure bill? And they were derided for a lack of transparency. This one from CNN. U.S. is receiving dozens of USO, UFO reports a month, said a senior Pentagon official. This is from October after they had opened up a UFO reporting website. Here's another from The Guardian. The UFO, U.S. urged to reveal UFO evidence after claims that it has intact alien vehicles. Some of you may have seen the uh, Tic Tac video and some others that were released which were U.S. war planes, jets that filmed and, and um, had the pilots speaking excitedly about what they were seeing and, and recording. Now, I want to shift a little bit to a very credible source. In this case, this is uh, Daniel Sheehan. Uh, an attorney. Some of you may recognize the name. Uh, he goes by the nickname Danny, uh, and he bills himself as a federal civil rights attorney. You may or may not recall his name because he was involved in the Pentagon Papers, first of all, uh, as a young uh, lawyer, not far after his graduation from Harvard Law. He got involved in the Pentagon Papers and released those and then a, a few years later, he got involved with Watergate. He was the one who broke the Watergate and the uh, uh, the plumber's story that brought down the Nixon administration. And he has been a tremendous advocate of civil rights. He got uh, 157 counts dismissed from the Black Panthers where they were set up and um, he, in his case, it took the jury about 15 minutes to decide that they um, would dismiss all 157 counts. Uh, he's done a lot of work for the American Civil Liberties Union. Why am I bringing him up? Well, I'm bringing him up because more recently he has become involved uh, in the matter of UFOs. In fact, he was Dr. Stephen Greer's primary attorney for uh, quite some time until a couple of years ago. And he was recently interviewed on the New Thinking Aloud with Jeffrey Mishlove podcast and uh, YouTube channel. And it's a tremendous interview. I recommend it highly. I'm going to put it in the chat. This is one of the most credible people in the world, having broken very significant stories and done very significant work to reveal information that was being kept secret. And he is now um, at 78-ish years old, uh, made it his primary case to help reveal uh, UFO, UAP um, disclosure. And he's also been on some other podcasts and things. So I'll leave that there and take any questions anybody might have. So the ultimate point that I'm making is that uh, uh, there's a tremendous amount of evidence, and even if a little bit of it is true, and our government has uh, possession of alien spacecraft and possibly alien beings and has been studying them and reverse engineering them uh, and has actually managed to um, create anti-gravity and uh, craft that can leave the atmosphere as has been seen in, in many, many videos. I, I, I could have bored you with lots of uh, uh, videos on the subject. Um, th there is quite likely some serious fire that's causing all this smoke. Jim, did you want to say something? Um, yeah, uh, I'll share something um, that may be relevant. Uh, Many years ago, I attended a meeting and a gentleman was talking about his wife's experiences. She had since passed 
but uh, as a young child, at nighttime, she would occasionally get transported to another planet someplace. It might not even be in this galaxy, I don't know. But uh, she, uh, she had remembrances of this. And later in life, um, this all kind of came back to her. And she was able to, uh, in a trance-like state, manifest uh, things like leaves from plants from that planet. Um, and when they'd give these leaves to uh, botanists, uh, they would recognize there is no known uh, plant species on this earth that uh, matches what she had given them. So where I'm going with this is that um, we have, many people have a fixed idea that, uh, that our knowledge of transportation between one point and another might be limited by the speed of light. Um, but perhaps that's an artificial limitation we place on ourselves. Um, we just haven't progressed our knowledge enough. Um, if we have some evidence now, like you're suggesting, uh, where are these um, ships coming from? Obviously, it seems pretty obvious they're not coming from this solar system. Um, how are they getting here? So there must be some way that they can travel that we have not yet figured out. Yeah, this has been one of the problems with this information is that people have been um, skeptical because of the fact that they can't imagine a technology that would enable interstellar travel uh, because of the amount of time necessary and so forth. Um, I'll also mention it that uh, I, I have a theory that the UFOs, ETs, they're operating at a, a, a certain spiritual level, um, a, a level that's quasi-physical. You know, we can touch and, and um, we think things are physical, but then many near-death experiences will report being on the other side, seeing loved ones, being able to give a, an actual genuine hug. Uh, being able to see and feel and touch it, uh, things that felt as solid or more than the things that we feel in our reality. But they're clearly not in our reality. Their bodies here, dead from an accident or, or a situation in a, a hospital, and their mind is somewhere else having this very real experience. So I think there's a lot more going on. And I think um, some of the ET uh, uh, abduction stories may actually be out-of-body experiences that these folks are having. So uh, I'm going to move on. I see Leslie has her hand up and then Sheila. So thank you, Jim. Leslie, what have you got for us? Sure. So my question is this, Daniel. Have there been fewer uh, UFO sightings more recently? So in the past, there seemed to have been a lot more of them. Uh, in the last while, it doesn't seem to be as many. Is it because we're getting better at identifying false flags or something else going on, do you think? Okay, let me mention, the uh, touch on the subject of the false flag, so to speak. The concept here, if you haven't heard about it, is that some of these sightings are, uh, I'm speaking to the general audience, some of these sightings are potentially our government ships and craft and, and technology that we have created and that we are causing these sightings to mess with people or who knows. Um, Dr. Stephen Greer will tell you that they're, they've been planning to do a false flag uh, event where they're going to do negative things and make it look like aliens did it to get us all to um, unite against the, the invaders. Um, while I do believe there are positive and negative beings of all sorts and in all areas of, of existence, um, I believe that there are many more positive uh, ETs uh, uh, piloting UFOs and visiting us than negative ones, because I think you need to be on the positive side to really understand and master this technology. And yes, yeah, so some of them um, probably are negative. So the other key point I wanted to make that I forgot to make before is that the government passed a new whistleblower protection law. So many folks have come 
forward as far back as as 99 with uh, the disclosure project and the the um, press club event that Stephen Greer put together and the newer one he did just this past summer um, with even more uh, testimony. A lot of these folks have have indicated that they were fearful to come forward because they would lose, say, their government pension or that they would be discredited or or um, this, many of them have said they've been visited by people telling them, zip it or you're not going to be a happy camper. So uh, it's it's an interesting subject. Did I answer your question? Not sure that you did. So are there fewer sightings now okay. than there were? Or are they about the same? I don't believe there are fewer. I, I think there are tremendous. So I've gone to something that uh, Stephen Greer has promoted something called CE5, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. And he's got a protocol of meditation and calling in the aliens. You go sit out in a dark field with friends and you all meditate and and um, say, you know, we'd love to see you. And they appear. Now, I actually went to one of these events uh, here near us in, in the Charlotte area. We've got a CE5 group and we saw stuff. Now, these are not pushover people. They were like, okay, that's a satellite. You can tell because of X. And that's uh, the, 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 the space station passing by. You can tell about that because... and satellites and space stations and things they they move in very straight patterns and at very uh, specific speeds but then you get something that appears flashes stays still moves to another spot flashes again moves to another spot what is that okay and many other things so i can say that i've seen these sorts of things and i think there's a lot of folks uh seeing these sorts of things but it, why report it it's 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 not worth reporting it's becoming so commonplace i do believe that in the next uh, year or two there uh, is going to be a major sighting uh, i'm going to go out on a limb and, and say that because i've heard it from a number of sources that uh, we've gotten to the point in our evolution where you know they they did have done these major sightings occasionally there was the Stevensville incident in uh, Stevensville, Texas. There was the Phoenix Lights incident where hundreds of people saw this enormous craft and then it was poo-pooed and put aside and, and it fell yeah. off the radar. So I don't think there, are, there may be fewer incidents lately of that type, but they've never been real common. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right. Sheila. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I have something to share, and then I have a question for you. Okay. But what I want to share, and you know this, is that I channel regularly from the star Orion, the star being is Yannick, um, and I publish this once a month. The latest channeling from him was a bit truncated and complex, and some of these words I have never seen before in my life. I had to look them up myself. But it's about war, and he's talking about how we should approach war, or he's giving us some clues as to what might be going on. Um, I'm just going to read a few sentences and then go on. Your role to be aware is to be aware that nations are valid in their approach to peace. Withdraw, withdraw patently from obviation of review. Go to the place of cunning for swords to be rearranged before they are relinquished. Four days after this was published is when Putin said, yes, I want to call a ceasefire as long as I am declared the winner. And I got cold chills because this one was a bit strange for me and I remembered it and I went back to it and I thought, Go to the place of cunning for swords to be rearranged before they are relinquished. He knows. I mean, he knows what's going on with us. So my question to you is, do you think the government has ever tried to communicate with these folks via channeling? Oh, I, it, it's been reported that they um, are in direct communication, not just through channeling, but through... Um, some of these secret elements. 
uh, supposedly are in uh, direct communication. In fact, some have reported that back when we first started with alien retrievals and things back around the 40s, um, supposedly, you know, Hiroshima and the nuclear testing and nuclear bombs uh, alerted them to the fact that we had reached a certain level of, of uh, sophistication that they should check in on us again. And um, supposedly, we were approached, the government was approached by both positive and negative beings. And um, the, the positive being said, we'll teach you the spiritual nature of the universe and consciousness. And the negative being said, we'll help you win the wars and we'll help you be the most powerful country on earth. And supposedly they, <laughs> they chose from column B and uh, that we've been in contact with those beings and perhaps the others as well ever since. Mm -hmm. So, when was when did Putin uh, make that statement that you just mentioned? I hadn't heard that news. Yeah, he made this statement. It came out. I get news clips from New York Times. This was published on the nineteenth of December. Four days after that, I think it was on a Saturday. Okay. I saw it in a news clip where he said, "Yes, I would love a ceasefire as long as I am declared the winner." Very and yet rearrangement, my mind just went back to re rearrangement of swords yeah. um, before they are relinquished. And when that's exactly what he's talking about. So personally, I believe that um, uh, the wars that we're seeing now are probably some of the last wars we will see. Um, and uh, that it's the last gasp of the, the negatives, the dark side before we actually uh, come into the light, I think. So yeah. thank you, Sheila. I'm going to go to Arun. You can unmute yourself. <clears throat> Thanks, Daniel. And uh, I believe your background is rightly reflecting the topic that you chose on the galaxy. <laughs> so uh, the couple of uh, 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 points that I wanted to make uh, that I heard in a in a audio book when I drove from Canada to NC. Uh, one was. Uh, uh, the distinction between a primate and us is so, so tiny, yet the advancement that we are from the primates, where we are able to dictate how the earth operates, looking at that, if you assume the, the minor advancement in another alien race, the fear of what they could do, if, if we are able to if, if we see how it would play out, uh, it, it's very astonishing to see what uh, the ability of those alien race could be, uh, mm -hmm. that comparison. Ha having said that, uh, could they be of negative? So to your point, Daniel, probably the negative that we see on Earth today is probably breathing is its last breath. So someone who is advanced to us may already have seen the negatives of where we are, and they would have consciously decided against it and they could probably come in peace and not war. Yeah. So from the spiritual material I've studied, including the law of one, um, supposedly duality and the ability to cho choose negatively exists uh, for several levels ahead of us. Um, but then you eventually get to uh, the level where you can't, advance any further on the negative path because it, it can only take you so far. Um, so I, I personally ascribe to that belief. And I think that we've been um, aided and protected by the positive extraterrestrials. Um, so and another else? point I wanted to make, Daniel, is that there is also a discussion around what would be the physiology or the, the body's shape and structure make of the aliens and uh, uh, there is a, a book where i read that the fundamental unit that we are all made of is carbon and the reason being carbon is one of those atoms which is able to make connections with such diverse elements like amino acids proteins etc which are uh, which are the foundation to any nature so it is fairly uh, uh, probable to assume that the aliens are uh, also of our similar anatomy. So if we were to 
develop something to counter them we could we might as well just look at some bio weapons or uh, anything that would harm us would very likely harm the alien race is is uh, an interesting uh, uh, fact that i read somewhere uh, thank you uh, i'll respond and then uh, we'll go to pauline and we'll uh, switch over to mark here um, i think some of the beings some of the extraterrestrials are non-physical uh, you know, we, we, we know through near-death experiences and other paranormal things, out-of-body experiences, that consciousness can move about independent of a physical body. So I think that there are many, many types of, of life in the universe. Uh, Paulina, hello? What have you got to Hi, share with um, us? It's a question, but also like a comment. Um, well, I was looking at a picture yesterday and I found it really interesting. It was actually about a, like an alien with a face like like that, that has a big, big cranial and giving a mushroom to uh, an ape, right? So it got me thinking about many things. And like we were saying, like, how do they look or um, like what are, what are their aesthetics and it got me thinking into two things that i think are most interesting here one of the things that it got me thinking is that what do we think about the spirit why do we relate to spirit and i at least it is in my perception that we relate to spirit as being something like uh like like non-physical right when as leslie was saying like indigenous cultures never separated in spirit and material world like that that's only like in us westerns but in other cultures like the spirit and the culture in itself even not from a shamanic perspective but i think the spirit is not it's not um alienated from what the word is like it's not the, the spirit is not um it's not foreigner to everything, right? It's a part of everything. So that that's what it got me thinking. And the other thing that it got me thinking is, um, um, well, it was something that also um, I think Jim was saying. And Jim was saying that, it, and it also got me thinking into this, right? I have done some practices around hypnosis. And one of the things that my spirit told me is that the spirit is in my skin. And this thing, it's also like, it really interested me because sometimes I also like grew up with a very religious thinking or um, thinking that the spirit is something like, like somewhere else, but the spirit is actually like in the skin, right? You were talking right now about the body and somehow like, uh, like something that is concrete, but to imagine that the spirit is it's in the skin, and it's also remind me what Jean po pointed out about the experiment that was being done around uh, the images and how something in your skin already knows what it's this what it's the next picture going to be about. So it, it got me thinking into that word, the spirit, and how do we how do we as Westerners or something that has not the ancient knowledge it does not relate to spirit as something really material or part of our world um and my question is i think it's um well my question is um it's also part of i think of the three presentations but what would be the purpose of of all right maybe that's a big question but like what would be the purpose of of these beings if they are like, if they can be anywhere, or at least at most parts of the space or time, more than we can be, what would be their purpose uh, towards us that we can be only in like a one place at a time and one space at a time? So, what would be that our purpose related to them? Um, okay, that's my question. Let, let me answer as briefly as possible so Mark can get on the stage here. Um, I, I suspect that um, they're curious. Uh, they look at us sort of the way we look at uh, animals in the zoo. And uh, it's, it's kind of like, wow, look what the, uh, that crow can do with tools. Look at what that octopus can do. And um, if you've seen any of the documentaries on, on, on intelligent animals. And I think uh, to Arun's point that uh, they're, 
they've been genetic engineering for a long time. And uh, some say that we are the product of genetic engineering, that they took the uh, chimps and they tweaked them a little bit and said, yeah, let's give this a few hundred thousand years and see what happens. So I'll, I'll end it there and we'll toss it to Mark Hunter Brooks. Boy, <clears throat> well, thank you, Daniel. Uh, um, we've listened to uh, three presentations tonight and every, everyone's comments, and I just wanted you all to reflect on what you've heard. And the the thing that I feel like, and, and I wrote a book about it, is that the challenge before us is uh, how to make the subjective objective. And we have personal experiences. I know, Sheila, you talked about your experiences. Paulina, you talked about your experiences. but. Uh, a scientist who deals in objective facts or objective truth uh, will not accept subjective experiences. And I think one of the things that's the challenge for us is how to make the subjective objective. And that was uh, one of the areas that I've really been interested in in the past few years. And I wanted to say, in, and as I wrote in a, in a book about it, is that we can do that by changing how science perceives reality. And science talks about particles, they talk about quantum mechanics, but uh, another way to look at reality is to say that it's fully wave-based. And that was the, the theme of my book. Um, but what I think is important about saying anything is that we need to get back to the root of uh, what we want to try and prove. We talked about Aliens, UFOs, ETs, shamanism, and trance states, ayahuasca, and near-death experiences, and all these things, but they're easily dismissed because they don't, don't fall within the paradigm of traditional science. But if we go back to the very root level of uh, what people believe, and I say not the worldviews like science or religion or metaphysics, but the supporting pillars for those worldviews, I think that's where we'll find that things are different. And if we say that reality is not particle-based or quantum mechanics-based, but it's fully wave-based, and I'll explain that in just a second, that we can explain the paranormal, we can explain miracles in the Bible, we can explain scientific anomalies, we can explain near-death experiences, how people channel uh, why ETs can do these amazing things in, in UFOs. Um, but it all goes back to changing science, making the subjective objective. And that's the point I really wanted to make, is that that's the challenge before us when we talk about the convergence of spirituality and science. It's doing that very thing. And uh, one of the things that I proposed in my book was to prove these basic uh, claims, you know, that, that reality is really fully wave-based, I offered experiments so that you could disprove it. And that's what you do with the scientific method, is that before scientists will believe something, they have to repeatedly fail at disproving it. And if someone comes up with a new theory or a new idea, one of the things that they're expected to do as part of submitting that idea or theory is to submit proposed experiments for how to falsify that claim or to disprove that claim so that scientists around the world can perform those experiments and either have them fail or succeed. So I, I think but when we talk about all these things that we've discussed this evening, it's easy for science to dismiss it because it's so far down the line of, of explanations that if we go back to the very root, of uh, science and spirituality, and I say it's at the pillars supporting our worldviews, and change that worldview, change that pillar, uh, change that worldview or those worldviews by changing the pillars that we'll be able to explain these things later on. Now, let me go into a wave-based reality a little bit more as uh, just a proposal, and it's a concept, uh, a conjecture, if you want to say it, if you want to use these big scientific words. But uh, imagine an FM radio, and as you change the dial on an FM radio, you can change from one station to another, to another, to another. And if you imagine a fully wave-based reality, then you could say we're wave-based beings. And if we change from one wavelength to another or one frequency to another, we can change from one reality to another or from one dimension to another. 
And I explained that or a, a way or a concept of how you could do that in my book. But I also offer an experiment of how you can falsify that or how you can disprove it so that you could present it to science and let them do the experiments on it. Then it becomes it's it's in science's ballpark as to whether they accept it or not. But uh, that that's the point I wanted to say is we can explain the paranormal as uh, being spiritual abilities that are present in non-physical beings living in different dimensions that we're partly non-physical ourselves. And as such, we're able to access those abilities like channeling, like uh, going into trances, like talking to spirits, like telepathy, like mediumship, uh, or some of the things that you see and uh, that Leslie talked about with shamanism and, and some of the abilities that people have, healing abilities. Um, but that's that's the point. Now, there's, there's a way that you can individually uh, make the subjective objective. And you've talked about, or people have talked about a number of experiences that they've had. There's two things that, or two uh, events that I heard of where I felt like there was sufficient evidence for an individual to make the subjective objective for them. And I wanted to share it with you so that you may be able to add on to it or change it or modify it to where you could take an experience that you've had and make it objective as opposed to subjective so that you know something's true. And I know that with your experiences, you often know something is true yourself, but you can't show it to somebody else. Um, let me say these two experiences that that I heard about that I was really impressed with. One was um, by Tom Campbell, and he wrote about this on page 85 of his book, My Big Toe, where he was helping um, Robert Monroe set up his lab to do out-of-body tests or out-of-body work. And one of the ways that Robert Monroe paid Tom Campbell was he allowed Tom to experience some of the things that he was trying to set up and show as part of the Monroe Institute. One of the events that Tom participated in was where he and another engineer who was helping Robert Monroe set up the labs, they went on an out-of-body experience together. And Robert Monroe recorded what they each said throughout the conversation or throughout the hour and a half that they were both out of body. And when they came back, Robert or Monroe invited them up to the control room where he was, and he played back both tapes so that they could see that within a minute of each other, they were experiencing the same things. And that's where Tom said in his book, he says, I spent the whole weekend saying, oh, this could possibly be true. This could be true. This could be true. And that was the moment for him where his subjective experiences or his thoughts about out-of-body experiences, maybe being an illusion or a hallucination or something else, became a reality for him. And there was another thing that I had heard for people who go to mystery, st mystery schools or intuitives who um, do guided meditation is uh, doing a joint meditation. I heard this uh, from someone who had done this with an instructor, is they would go on a guided meditation together and hold hands so that they were both in the in the meditation or in the in the space, the astral space or whatever you'd want to call it together. And that's how the the student would know that what they were doing was real. So just those two things for an individual to make the subjective objective. But I think it's incumbent on us to talk about our experiences, but talk about them in a way that, or think about them as to how you could do it in a way to make the subjective objective, because that's the way you can prove it to science. And I'll end with this as one of the things that I think may be uh, the turning point event for science is, and I've heard other people talk about this, is, uh, where people will come up with a way to communicate with a non-physical, either with a, a soul phone, and I think Gary Schwartz is uh, one of the professors who's working on that, uh, along with some other people, or with video. And uh, there was uh, one guy who wrote in his book that it's when that happens, that's when science will be unable to deny it any longer, and they'll have to accept that the non-physical exists, and then that will cause what they call a paradigm crisis, where science will have to go back and retrace their steps to uh, say, how can we explain this from, in scientific terms? And then they may come back to the standpoint of saying that it may not be particle 
physics. It may not be quantum mechanics. It may not be quantum or color dynamics. I forget the, or electrodynamics. I can't remember the name exactly, but it might be something else. And with that, I'll take questions. Daniel? Yes, sir. Very interesting. So, um, get, okay. <clears throat> so it seems to me that uh, I love your theory or hypothesis, whatever you want to call it. Um, it seems quite clear from the science that things are essentially wave-based and we're becoming more and more uh, comfortable and aware of that uh, generally. So for, for me, it's it seems pretty uh, obvious. And I think <clears throat> as we get better and better with our instruments at measuring things, that we will become capable of measuring things that we've been incapable of uh, measuring, such as thoughts. They're already, mm -hmm. you know, able to detect brain waves and they're starting to say, okay, think about X, think about Y, and they're able to detect the difference. And now with AI and uh, who knows what else, they're, they're, they're anticipating reading minds and, um, you know, being able to have uh, telepathically controlled instruments and things. And I think ultimately we, we will get to the point where we'll able to, to not just read the, the frequencies coming out of the brain, which I think is very crude. I think we'll be able to um, understand what it is that enables telepathy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that will cause one of those uh, paradigm shifts, one of those mm -hmm. issues, as will, I think, any of the subjects we've been discussing, if, if mm -hmm. when they get to a certain point where they're undeniable, um, one of my favorite quotes is that science advances one funeral at a time. I, know, I love that one. Yeah. That's Max Planck, the inventor of quantum mechanics. And I think you might have been thinking of quantum electrodynamics, QED. Quantum perhaps? electrodynamics, yeah, I know. Uh, it, it's It's gotten more and more complex. And one of the things that uh, I like to say is to consider the concept that quantum mechanics, quantum electrodynamics uh, may be a 21st century equivalent of geocentrism, where back in the 1600s, people thought the Earth was the center of the solar system. And they got accurate results when they would do their mathematics or do their experiments. But the math was just totally complex. And I think the same thing exists today, is that people are getting uh, experimental results down to like 12 digits behind the decimal in terms of accuracy. But the mathematics that are involved causes people to drop physics as a major in college because they can't handle the complex math that's part of it. But if you look at it from a different perspective or consider a different perspective, be it fully wave-based, be it something else, just go out and look. That's, that's what I wanted to say is consider looking for some other concept or some other way of looking at what you're seeing to see if that might simplify what it is. So there's a, um, somebody asked, Tom Campbell a question um, recently that was published on his channel, uh, his YouTube channel, where they said, uh, is, because he's, you know, able to go out of body and stuff, mm -hmm. he said, is the earth flat or spherical? And I found this a wonderfully interesting question. I couldn't wait to hear what Tom Campbell had to say about it. And what he said basically was, doesn't really matter. You know, ultimately, we're spiritual beings learning spiritual lessons. And he, he said, we're here to learn, right. to become less fearful, right. and to be more loving. Right. That's what it's really all about. And the rest of it is just noise. But he said, you could look at it either way. And in the old days, before we found out we, we were heliocentric, they had all this complicated math to explain the weird movements of the of the planet so it was complicated like you were saying complicated physics but then they came up with heliocentrism and everything moving in ovals and suddenly it all got very simple it was mm -hmm. very easy i think the same will be true when we figure this all out that physics just like god bless albert einstein e equals mc squared yeah. i'm looking forward to that
Yeah. And uh, I'll even throw out an idea, a wave based, uh, fully wave based idea for how you could photograph or do videos of other realities. So uh, the people on the on the call, you may be familiar with the Schumann resonance, which is uh, 7.83 hertz. And, and it, there's a vibration that goes around the planet at 7.83 hertz, and that's caused by lightning strikes that occur uh, all around the Earth. And there's harmonics for that uh, 7.83 hertz Schumann resonance that are about every seven or eight hertz. They go up like three, four, five times. And uh, one of the ways you can think of uh, a wave-based reality is that we're in a standing wave, and that's how we can have particles. Uh, we're in a standing wave reality at 7.83 hertz. But uh, you could have another reality at 13 hertz, another one at 21 hertz, another one at 27, and another one at 35. And uh, if you can, say, take a digital camera, this, this was the idea that I had, take a digital camera and isolate it from the 7.83 hertz vibration that we have on our planet. Anything that is exposed to the atmosphere from, from the surface of the Earth to the top of the ionosphere, uh, which is about four miles up, is it's going to be subject to this 7.83 hertz vibration. But if you can isolate a digital camera so that it's not vibrating at 7.83 hertz, and then take that uh, light-sensitive CMOS sensor, it's, uh, uh, I forget what CMOS stands for, but uh, take the sensor at the back of the digital camera and vibrate it at another frequency, either the 13, 21, 27, or 35 hertz, you may be able to take pictures or videos of other realities. And that's, it's an idea just to throw it out, take it, modify it, use it ever how you might think, or communicate it ever how you might think, but uh, it's, it's an idea. And it's really for the benefit of, of the world and the collective and not really to try and uh, do any self-aggrandizement, but uh, it's something for y'all that uh, I just wanted to share. Hopefully something will come out as, as a result. Daniel? Well, there are already uh, people doing uh, uh, modifications to uh, video equipment of various sorts. Um, sort of like you were talking about the soul phone, them trying to come up with right. audio. Um, on the video side, they're they're using filters of various sorts and supposedly, when you get the filters right, and you've got the right type of sensor, mm -hmm. you know, a number of these things, you can see UFOs. You see things streaking across the, the sky that are invisible otherwise, uh, leaving heat signatures and other things. So there's that. Okay. Well, and, and looking at it from a wave-based perspective, how can a UFO appear and disappear is that it changes its vibration from a standing wave frequency to a non-standing wave frequency so that it can travel. Um, there's another thing I wrote about in, in the book is how can you lift, you know, multiple ton granite blocks like the Egyptians did. And uh, I said, consider that molecules or atoms uh, use angular momentum because the quarks inside the atoms, inside the protons and neutrons, it actually spins. So it could spin in three axes, X, Y, and Z. And the cumulative effect of all the atoms, molecules, you know, cells, or, or you know, just the conglomeration of everything gives you the mass. And uh, if you shut out, if you're able to shut all that off through your concentration or through focus or whatever, you could essentially make a 20 pound granite rock weightless. And you could also make it movable, just like you have in. Uh, some of these Mayan pyramids where you've, you've had granite blocks kind of subsume into little cavities or whatever. If there's no weight to it, if there's nothing supporting the mass uh, of that rock, it could flow down into something else. It, it's just a concept. But you, you can't explain that to a scientist until you've explained the basics or the, of reality. And that's why I wanted to get everybody back to the basic is you've got to get people to believe that basic of reality before you can talk about these other things with channeling, with healing, with UFOs, ETs, and, and all these other things. And, there, you know, there was one other, one other point I wanted to make. Yeah. If you, if you listen to the theory of relativity, which is 
you know, pretty well proven at this point, but we'll call it the theory. Um, at, at the speed of light, something experiences all space and no time. Mm -hmm. And at the other end of the spectrum, it experiences all time and no space. Did I say that right? Yes. And so what is the experience of a photon? It's traveling at the speed of light. That's a very interesting question to consider. Yes. I don't expect you to answer that. We'll go to Jim. Yeah, just a couple of little comments. Um, we do have scientists that are probing these questions who look at multiverse um, theory. These are astrophysicists who are um, saying that there's a possibility there are multiple universes that exist, which is kind of aligned with what Thomas Campbell was saying in, in his book. Um, we have this uh, phenomenon known as after-death communications. Um, people are receiving verbal uh, um, uh, nasal, you know, kind of a olfactory, uh, visual uh, interactions with people on the other side. Um, we have hospice nurses writing books about uh, nearing death awareness. Uh, you know, are we finding at the end of life that we're able to shift out of whatever frequency uh, we're bound on this earth to a, to a different frequency? We have out-of-body experiencers who do extensive travels in the non-physical realms and uh, report that there are varying levels of vibrational experiences that you can have. Um, so it's, we're kind of at the forefront of beginning to understand the diversity of what exists out there. And for most people, it's, it's probably beyond their, their mental um, desire to contemplate these things. But what's happening is people are getting forced to have to confront it. Think of all the near-death experiencers that now have to live with a different reality that they've after their experience. People are having their after-death communications. You know, the, there's even a science now um, induced after-death communications as a means of helping people deal with their uh, uh, grief at the loss of loved ones. If you can um, actually induce a communication with that deceased loved one, you know, it, it can go a long way toward reducing the grief that people feel. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Sheila? Yes. Um, I I don't know people in, uh, in the group know it or not, but I was a scientist for 45 years and started studying metaphysics about 12 years ago. So I have changed my perspective and have been in recent years excited about you know science and spirituality are merging and people are finding out everything is going on and it's exciting and so recently I've sort of changed my perspective and it's because of what is happening happening cosmically at the present time and the fact that it's happening so quickly and there's so much energy coming in at a rapid pace. Mm -hmm. So my thinking now is, I'm wondering, and I, I don't mean to be a pessimist, but have scientists missed the boat? And are we so far advanced at a, at a cosmic level that that bridge is just gonna be too much to try and traverse? Unless scientists, and the changes in the cosmic energy can somehow merge and be in the same energy. I'm really leaning toward scientists having missed the boat. I'm not trying to be difficult. It's just my brain is taking me there. I think there are many opportunities and we've talked about them here and Mark has just eloquently given us the tools to use, but is it too late? I mean, I don't see science catching up 
with levels of spirituality that we know about, but we just can't prove. I don't see that happening. Maybe it's not meant to happen. You know, we come here to grow spiritually and instead of focusing so heavily on physical reality and what we think about it, uh, just accept that this is a place we come to grow and advance. And it's really the non-physical that's the significant part of this. And I think that's where I am right now, which is surprising me. Jim, you know me and you know how much I've been excited about science and this is what's happening. And I'm sorry, my perspective has just changed because I took a step back and I looked at it and I went, hmm, there's a long way to go. I decided just to take that big step and there's not a bridge. And, and maybe not that. trying to uh, get everybody on board. I, I guess, I mean, that's kind of consciousness cafe is, I don't think any of us think that we're going to change world perception on things. I think we look at the edges, the people who maybe have had experiences and need help interpreting it, or people who have a, a serious interest in exploring metaphysical. This is a place you can go, but they're, it's like the woman I, Mark and I talked to several months ago when we had a, uh, a psychic on, uh, you know, that made a presentation. Her reaction was um, kind of a fundamentalist Christian view. That's the work of the devil. Mm -hmm. and it didn't matter how much Mark and I talked to her about it uh, and, and tried to present logical explanations for things. You know, she was stuck in a place that uh, uh, wouldn't hear of it. And that, that's her path. It's okay. We're not saying that, that her path is wrong. It's just her truth that she's walking and we're trying to help other people who have a, are seeking for a, a different truth. Yeah. And, and I'll add, it was her worldview. She had a, a religious worldview, just like scientists have a science worldview. And we need to change the perception of reality that's the pillar supporting those worldviews. And if you can do that, then you can change the worldviews and maybe make some change later on. I, I was also going to say, just reading that that I've done is that the generations coming up now are going to be more active spiritually. Uh, there's young people who are talking to spirits on a daily basis, uh, who are starting to realize they have spiritual abilities and and don't know how to control them or or what they are. And I think they're going to be the the group that's going to also force scientists to not be able to deny that something's going on and to start doing some research. So I, I look to to young people as well. And and then also too, one comment that, uh, that I heard is uh, for for older people who have spiritual backgrounds, they they said, or this one person asked, they said, how can you awaken someone who's already awake? Mm -hmm. So if someone was born awake, you know, uh, the best we could do is help them realize their abilities and help them realize that they aren't nuts or crazy or whatever. Uh, and and I'm sure there's other things y'all can think of too. And if you can, raise your hand and let's talk about it. That I thought Rune's that was good. interesting as well. Rune has his hand raised. Hey, so um, uh, so based on what I heard from Sheila, I just have a, a thought on that. So uh, the research that that's being focused on may not necessarily be trying to connect science with spirituality, but every big organization is funding research so as to understand how the mind works so as to so as to get the recommendation engines on Netflix, Facebook, etc. to cater to our interests. As a byproduct of what they do, I, I, I see a chance that they would get to appreciate how the mind works and how the connections are made which could lead us to what mark was explaining around the the vibrations the the waves the particles etc and a better understanding of it which could effectively get us a better understanding of spirituality uh, uh, as a byproduct that may not be the focus but I, I i believe that may happen for example the research the crispr research that won nobel prize it was not it was not necessarily intended to develop some vaccines, but uh, fortunately, that helped us with the COVID times mm -hmm. as as a as a as an extension to it. Similarly, what the likes of Facebooks, Googles, they are doing to keep us glued to the system may give us that understanding of the mind, and hence, in extension, spirituality. 
that's just my thought mm -hmm. yeah sheila I, I saw you uh drawing breath i didn't know if you had anything yeah. else to say yeah certainly um you know intuitively when i think about crispr you see i'm a microbiologist mm -hmm. so it all started in microbiology and now we're we're splicing human genes at least the chinese chinese people are um and when i when i look at that from an ethereal standpoint i look at it as knowledge that was gifted to us so to a certain degree what we are receiving now anywhere in our civilization and especially in science are gifts from the ethereal plane through our mental abilities now the evolution of that is what I question. I don't think that, you know, this, the cosmic part of it and the scientific part of it as we see it progressing are on the same plane at all or um, moving at the same pace at all. However, I do believe, like you said, they are connected mm -hmm. because we get that information. Uh, we don't, I mean, we don't just make it up you know, we're receiving. And the sad thing to me is scientists get this information as a gift. They don't know that they are receiving it. Mm -hmm. And I wish they did <laughs> because I think it would help not only the progression of science, but the progression of humanity to know that, that there's connection there, what we get in our brain and the gifts that we're given like mediumship and everything else comes from the ethos. Yes. And I, I think Daniel said this on an earlier uh, presentation too, is that there's no, there's nothing new. It's just things we relearn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's the, it's the realization I think that's missing. <laughs> It's the understanding of where we get our gifts. That's, I mean, there's a big gap there because in the scientific community, and I was in it for 45 years, I know that ego drives people mm -hmm. and they cannot get out of that ego. And that's very human. If by some chance, uh, you know, there's a, an event and, and, and something changes in our consciousness and we begin to look at those things that are being produced in science as partially gifts from the ethos, you know, that combines a lot of energy and that changes a lot of perspectives and maybe will accelerate some of the understanding between this is who we are as a human race. This is what makes us human. This is part of our humanity. So I, you know, I struggle with that just like Mark does. How do you do that? I don't know. <laughs> but I, I think awareness is, is key. Thank you. Oh, we're, we're up against nine o'clock, Mark. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll let Jim close us out if you don't mind. Not to put it on you, Jim, but, you, you know, you opened us up. Let's... Well, it's been a great evening of conversation. I hope that um, everybody who's been present got something out of this. Uh, there are a number of you that, that didn't have anything to say, but uh, I'd like to think we stimulated some thought. Um, we'd love to hear your comments. If you want to go to our uh, uh, meetup group and indicate uh, you whether you liked it or not, we'd love to hear your feedback. Um, if you think that you might like to hear more of this on different subjects, we can do that as well. Um, a couple things um, for the future that I'm aware of. Um, Daniel, you've got something coming up this uh, Saturday. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's the law of attraction in action. Uh, my um, meetup group and uh, we're meeting Saturday at one o'clock and the uh, subject is 20, uh, mastering 
uh, here we go, the subject, all the secrets of effortless manifestation to make 2024 your best year yet. And uh, every so often I get inspired to reorganize my, my information, add new information. And um, this is a, a new presentation show. So that's under the law of attraction in action uh, meetup group. Thank you. On the 17th of February, we have an in-person meetup here in Greensboro for Consciousness Cafe. Um, we met last Saturday and had a great conversation. Um, people sharing insights. Uh, it's it's a it's nice to be in physical presence with someone. On the 20th of February, Leslie's going to make a presentation. Leslie, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. I'll be talking about the sacredness and science of essential oils. So if you have any questions or you're using essential oils yourself, I hope that you tune in. And uh, this is relatively new. We haven't even posted it really, but on the 27th of February, uh, Michelle Claire, who is a three-time near-death experiencer, will be making a presentation. I heard her speak at the Hawaiian IANS group and was so impressed with the diversity of um, information that she shared that I, I got in touch with her and asked if she'd be willing to make a presentation for our group. So uh, the 27th of February, we'll be uh, uh, having her. And uh, sometime in March, I don't have it on my calendar, but we have another presentation from uh, uh, Christian Sunburn about his near-death experience. And so keep your eyes peeled for uh, more information on that subject. Anything else anybody would like to add? I put a couple links in the chat and I wanna say thank you all for being here. Yeah, that's great, Paulina. Good to see you from the cold climes of uh, Canada. <laughs> all right, everybody, thank you very much. We'll be uh, posting this recording on our on a YouTube channel at uh, The Consciousness Cafe. So if you want to see that or recommend it, feel free to pass that along. All right. Well, we'll bring this evening. Daniel, you want something else? I'm Anything? just saying Say thank goodbye. you and goodbye. All right. Sheila, thank thanks you. for your input today. Arun, thank you for participating as well.